Hi folks, uh, Bill Fairman and Jonathan Davis here. Uh, we are this whole month. We've been talking about the beauty of the numbers. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, the numbers for multifamily buy and hold. Uh, we have uh, Tim Bratz that has uh, graciously uh, decided to come back and get abused one more time. Yep. <laughs> well, I would say one more time. Hopefully we'll get to abuse him in the future too. <laughs> so we'll do all that uh, right after this. Welcome back and thank you so much for joining us on the Real Estate Investor Show. Hard money for real estate investors. We are Carolina Capital Management. We're lenders in the Southeast for real estate investors. If you're interested in borrowing money, go to carolinahardmoney.com. Click on the apply now tab. If you're a passive investor looking for passive returns, click on the accredited investor tab. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, hit the bell and sign up for Wednesdays with Wendy. Okay. So Wendy Sweet, who is not here with us, she's re returning her rental car out in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. She's a, a mastermind all week. It's funny. We go to these things and I went to the first one. I told her it was a great uh, thing to go to. And she reluctantly kicking and screaming went out there and all she could do was talk about what a great time she had. <laughs> yep. what, what a worthwhile cause it was. Yeah, she texted me the other day and she's like, I hate to admit it, but man, this was a, <laughs> this is a good event. No, she just <laughs> hate to admit that I was right. Yeah. That's, that's what, what it was. was. Yeah. <laughs> um, what the heck are we talking about? Oh, uh, let's get to some really quick, uh, breaking news. If you don't mind. Okay. There's not really a ton to add other than, uh, housing starts are well below expectations. They're down like 7% mm -hmm. uh, month over month. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a big deal. Uh, I'm assuming a lot of it has to do with not being able to get supplies, labor, and, uh, and the cost of uh, getting this stuff done. Same thing with permits. Permits are down 3% yeah. uh, from the previous month. Unemployment, it's, it's about the same. Uh, it keeps getting lower and lower on the initial uh, jobless claims, uh, but we still have 10 million job, 10 million job openings. So those numbers should be a heck of a lot lower. Man, I tell you, I wish I had an opportunity to flip burgers for $18 an hour. My first <laughs> job was like $5 an hour. Uh, but what is up? Foreclosures are up. Yeah. Foreclosures are way up. Comparatively well, speaking, what are you, you know, what are you comparing to last month or are you comparing to 2019? Compared to 2019, they're still down 60%. So, well, I'm surprised, frankly, I'm very surprised that people are allowing their homes to go in the foreclosure because if they're in a certain box in most areas, you can sell them. Uh, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of upside down in them. Well, I mean, <laughs> they are up because the more, you know, moratorium ended and all this other stuff, no, but I get all that. Most but... houses won't be over leveraged, but yeah. some still yeah. either have, you know, a lazy borrower or just a bad situation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but these people should be able to sell those homes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that said, was the open door is now paying uh, not just market uh, prices for for homes on the MLS, but they're uh, no contingencies, paying all the closing costs. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Zillow's not <laughs> buying, right? And that's right. <laughs> um, okay, that's enough breaking news. Well, all right, one last one. Congress is still doing nothing. That's that's music to our ears. <laughs> all right. Tim, thank you so much for joining us. I'm uh, sorry you had to listen to us drone on. I love it. I love it, man. Uh, uh, you got me you fired up at the end there. Really fired yeah, up. You, I'm excited you, now. You, you cannot get any better than government gridlock. That means oh, man. Feel safe. <laughs> 
anytime they can't decide on anything, it's always good for us. Right? Yeah, always. <laughs> Stagnation. So, hey, don't rock the boat, guys. Don't rock the boat. Let's just let, let let's let things ride out for at least another three years, and then we can we can talk about. It. Excellent. Let me get through all my investments, and then you know, yeah. then let's let's maybe change yeah. some things. I don't want to have to change my IRA. Please, no. Yeah. Oh, please, oh, no. Man. What a horrible um, idea that is! It's just such a terrible idea. It makes no sense. Well, it it only it only benefits one place, Wall Street, and like it, yeah. it makes no. I mean, the billions of dollars of transactions that take place utilizing that that vehicle would mm -hmm. just be gone, and then what? Like, yeah. what do, what do they think is going to happen? Like, we're going to have a complete. Well, either you know. The thing is, <laughs> I'll get on my high horse here. Say, capitalism is, hey, if you want to get a loan through a bank or through, uh, you know, a government-sponsored entity or through Wall Street, you can. They have they they can have set their own risk tolerance. And if you want to get it somewhere else that sets their own risk tolerance and their own yield rates, get it through them. Like that's called capitalism. That's called a free market. It, it's all about um, punishing the people that have choice and the as government has grown they want to give people fewer and fewer choices that's all there is to it mm -hmm. so yeah um okay if you're stepping down uh, the high I, horse? I, I, okay. and it just drives me nuts but anyway yeah it's it's a conversation it's, for it's aggravating man yeah so so tim <clears throat> this this whole month we're concentrating on the numbers <clears throat> excuse me the numbers we were doing fix and flip uh uh, previously, and we're going to be doing self storage on the next show. Uh, but we really want to uh, kind of get an idea when you're looking at your multifamily properties. And we can start off with uh, uh, your your value add, and that's what you do mostly, correct? Mm -hmm. it, it's your value add stuff. We just want to get an idea of some of the numbers you're looking for, and then you can throw in some uh, depreciation type of considerations in there. Uh, if you like, but kind of give us a, a, a an overview of what it is that you and your funds are looking for when you're uh, getting into the multifamily space. Yeah, yeah, I mean, good question, and I appreciate you guys having me back. It's always uh, always fun, always good conversation with you guys. So, uh, yeah, so I, I think the most important thing, or I guess, like, let's give it down to the basics, right? When you're valuing a single family home, single family home. To another single family home it's valued based on the comparable approach right i had an appraiser actually at my house i'm refinancing my home here in charleston um right now and and he's looking at other homes in the neighborhood comparatively speaking to this home size square footage bedrooms bathrooms the uh, you know all that kind of stuff um and, and obviously location and they're saying hey the house down the street's a five bed five bath and your house is a five bed six bath it's a little bit more square footage and you're on the water and they're not. And that one sold for you know, X number of dollars and yours would probably get, you know, 10% more, right? It's the comparative approach. When you look at apartment buildings, it's valued very differently. Apartment buildings are valued com completely based on the income approach. So that means you take all the revenue that the building generates minus all the expenses in order to operate it. And it leaves you with a net operating income. And then the value of that building is a multiple of that net operating income. It's called a cap rate. So it's valued the same way that a business would be valued. If you're going to go buy a business, you want to know what kind of cash flow it kicks off. What's the net income of that business? And what kind of return on your investment are you going to get if you go and buy that business for X price? Buildings, are, apartment buildings are, are valued the exact same way. So when we're looking at an apartment building, uh, the two major factors that affect the net operating income is the income and the expenses. Mm. So when I look at an apartment building, I'm looking at not what are the expenses today or what are the rents today. When you flip a house, you're looking at, hey, uh, what can I sell it for? Not what is it worth today, right? So I'm, look, I'm doing the same thing. I'm looking at the stabilized rents mm -hmm. and the stabilized expenses, not the today's rents and the today's expenses. It could have terrible management in place. They could be running up maintenance because they haven't renovated the place in forever. They could have, uh, uh, because of the poor maintenance and poor management, there's probably a lot of tenant turnover. 
There's probably, you know, they're probably overspending. They're not shopping around for different vendors and exterminators and landscapers and all those kinds of things. They're probably not appealing to property taxes. Uh, they're probably not shopping their insurance around. They're probably not installing low flow water fixtures and LED lights to reduce their utility expenses. They're not, most mom and pop owners um, are not doing those kinds of things. So when I go into an apartment building, I'll, I'll look at what could this thing rent for if it was fully renovated, it was in good shape. It might be getting $700 a month now, but if I could run comps in a mile radius, three mile radius or five mile radius and show that you know a one bedroom can actually rent for $900 a month and a two bedroom should be renting for $1,200 a month, that allows me to then underwrite the numbers of kind of like with a single family house. If you underwrite a single family and you say, hey, all the houses in this neighborhood are selling for $200,000, if uh, you know, I want to be all in for seventy percent of that after repair value, right? And so I need to be all in for one forty. It's going to cost me thirty thousand dollars of renovations, which means that my maximum allowable offer is one hundred ten thousand dollars. You guys following me so far on the single family side? You yeah. understand that, right? Multifamily, I do the same thing. So I'll take whatever the stabilized rents are, and then I know what the stabilized expenses are going to be. A lot of them you can look up. You can have your insurance agent shop the insurance. Management's a fixed amount of whatever the gross collected rents are. You're going to have some salaries and some, there's some other expenses and other line items, I would say, um, outside of what you have in the, in the residential world. But we take all those things and we have the net the stabilized net operating income. And then I divide by whatever that market cap rate is. So if it's, uh, let me just, uh, let me give you some numbers, right? I'll get my calculator out real quick. If you have an apartment building that generates $100,000 of net operating income, and you're in an area that, let's say, property appraises at a 6% cap rate. Pretty standard for right now. That means at $100,000 NOI, at a, divided by 0 0.06, a 6% cap rate, the stabilized value of that is somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.6 to $1.7 million. Okay? I don't want to pay retail. You guys are investors. You don't pay retail. Sure. I don't want to pay retail either. I want to buy it at a discount. So I know that if I want to be all in for, let's say, 70 cents on the dollar, I just multiply that by 0.7, which means my all-in price has to be $1.17 million. You guys following me so far? Yep. yep. Then I deduct so, out the construction cost the same way that you deduct out the construction cost in the resident or yeah, in the residential side. And let's say it's two hundred thousand dollars, which means most I can pay my maximum allowable offer is nine hundred sixty-six thousand dollars. So that's how I value the properties overall. And I'm sure we can get deeper into the woods or into the weeds, but high level, that's, uh, that's how we value apartments. Yeah. And when you, when you say, you know, cap rates, capitalization rates, uh, and, and you know, most stabilized, you know, in, in large MSAs are trading between, you know, four and 6% cap rates. Can you, can you kind of explain what determines a cap rate or like, cause when you're buying something, you're not, you don't want to buy it at a six cap. Obviously, like you just said, you want to be buying it somewhere probably between an eight and a 10, and then you want to exit it at that retail. Yes. So there's a lot, there's a, a couple complexities in that. Um, the thing is like, if you're buying a value, all right, so let's, let's define cap rate first. A cap rate is essentially this exact same thing as a return on investment or an unleveraged yield. It's as mm -hmm. if you bought that building cash, what would your return on investment be? So if I came in and I bought an apartment building with cash, uh, uh, you know, million dollar apartment building that yielded uh, $100,000 in net operating income, that means my cap rate at my basis would be 10%, right? Mm -hmm. But the market cap rate, it's kind of like, uh, it's, it's capitalism, right? It's what are people in these areas buying properties for at what sort of cap rates are properties trading for? That is where the comparable approach does come in because you're looking at what other buildings sold for on a cap rate basis. But just because that's a hundred unit building and you got a hundred unit building doesn't mean that you're going to sell for the same price per unit because they might be a lot better at generating revenue or, or uh, saving on expenses than mm -hmm. what our building could be doing, right? Or, or vice versa. So you can't look at it from a price per unit basis. You have to look at the NOI, but a cap rate is return on investment or unleveraged yield. Um, if I bought this thing cash, what kind of return on investment would I have? And, and that's my 
return on investment or my cap rate at my cost basis but it could be valued at something very different in that marketplace. If you're buying in a marketplace that, that trades at a 5% cap, then that building's worth $2 million, right? Um, so, so, so there's two cap rates that you're looking at. What is the return on investment cap rate for me at my cost basis? And then mm -hmm. what is the market value as well? And yes, you want a delta to be there. For my yeah. model, I essentially do the, the Burr method, the buy, renovate, rent, refinance. Mm -hmm for apartment buildings. So I need to be able to buy it, renovate it, put good tenants in place, put good uh, management in place, and then refinance it inside a couple of years. And I create appreciation. I force that appreciation up because mm -hmm. I increase the in income and decrease the expenses. And that allows me to then be all into a $10 million building for $7 million, right? So it's worth $10 million because it nets, let's call it $600,000 a year and it's at a 6% cap rate, so it's worth $10 million. But at my cost basis, I'm all into it for $7 million. It's really like a 9% cap rate at my cost basis. It's a 9% cap rate to me. So do yep. you guys understand there's two different yep. rates that you're looking at? Um, so that, that's, a, that's a one thing to address. The other thing that, that you mentioned, Sharud, is that the, uh, you're going in cap rate and the refinance or stabilized cap rate, you want to go in you know, at a, at a higher cap rate or sell at a lower cap rate. Yeah. But if you think about it, I buy distressed stuff. A lot of times it's a 0% cap rate that I'm buying it at. Does that make sense? But it, once it's stabilized, then it's a 10% cap or a 9% cap to me at my cost basis. So yeah. I'm, I'm, again, it kind of goes back to, I'm not really concerned about what is it performing at right now? I, I'm concerned about what can it perform at once mm -hmm. I stabilize this property. And once I do stabilize it, then what kind of yield unleveraged yield am I going to get uh, at my cost basis? And, and what does that delta look like? Meaning if I can get, uh, typically you want probably a two to three point delta if you want to follow my Burr method, right? The way that I buy um, those kinds of properties. So if a, if a area is trading at a 6% cap rate, I usually need to be in, in that eight, eight and a half percent cap rate at my cost basis. It might have a 0% cap rate when I buy it because it's distressed and it's all beat up. It's got bad management in place. It's not performing. But in that 12 to 24 month time frame, I need it to be generating, you know, X number of dollars to yield me uh, an eight, eight and a half percent return on my investment or unleveraged yield. Yeah. No, see, that's what I love about multifamily and storage units, that forced appreciation. You can just find something completely mismanaged and uh, not often, but you, you can not even swing a hammer and change the value of that property just by changing some numbers on the paper on, mm -hmm. on the P&Ls. Like it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. And, and, and it's, and it's like the scale of it's insane. If you had a hundred unit apartment building, let me give you like an example. Let's say you got a hundred unit apartment building. What amount of rent is so nominal that nobody would ever move out of their apartment building for that or out of their apartment unit? What, what would you say? Like 20 bucks, right? We just do 20, 20 bucks. bucks. Yeah. Let's call it 20 bucks. You're going to bump the rent up 20 bucks across the whole board. Let's say you never touch anything in the property. You never mm -hmm. renovate a unit. You never reduce the utility expenses. You didn't even shop the insurance. You didn't do anything other than over the next 12 months, you bump up rents on every single unit by $20 per month. So we got $20 times 100 units equals $2,000 a month times 12 months is an extra $24,000 a year. Eh, that's cool, $24,000 a year. But look what it does to the value. If you divide that at a 6% cap rate, it increases know. the value of the building by $400,000 for doing Thanks something that nobody ever bats an eye at. Yeah. Okay. You just increase your net worth by 400 grand just by holding the property for, for 12 months and bumping up rents by 20 bucks a month. That's it. So you can, you can see how you can very predictably increase the value. Uh, hey, God forbid you actually renovate a unit, right? Or actually install uh, low flow water fixtures and you reduce the expenses and you increase that income and you add laundry and you add you know, uh, uh, signage or you add parking or you, you do some of these things to generate additional revenue and then do some other things to reduce the expenses. That, that NOI, as it grows, it's not just the cash flow that grows. It's the exponential factor of what it does to the value of the building. Hmm. So 
I'm going to get a little bit more into the weeds here and, and we'll talk about a, a, appraisals. And uh, my question is, if you do some major renovations, let's say, for example, it's a, you know, uh, large complex and uh, you, you typically use the water to uh, ir irrigate, uh, you know, for, for your landscaping and that type of thing. And let's say you put in a, uh, an expense to put in uh, cisterns and allow for uh, rainwater to fill that. And now you're not using the water anymore and that lowers expenses. And you do some other things that typically uh, apartments in that area are not going to do. Uh, but it's still, uh, while there was a major expense at the front end, it's saving your uh, expenses over time. Are, are appraisers giving you credit for that or are they still trying, are they still generally averaging uh, those savings out throughout the comparables? Does that make sense? Are, are yeah, they it, if, if, the, if the financials are seasoned for at least three months, then they will give you credit for that. Oh, nice. You, okay. you can't go in and right out of the gate, you said, hey, I just did it. And here's what the report right. says that this guy says how much money I'm going to make or save. Um, if you can show that savings for a, on a T3, a trailing three month financials, month over month profit and loss statement on a T3, then, then you can, um, yeah, you can absolutely put that towards the value. Um, nice. and, and, and we, we do it all the time, right? Like as soon as, as soon as we renovate an apartment building, um, and we can even show a little bit of a story, right? I might not have every single unit, uh, at $900 a month. There might be several that are seven, seven fifty that I haven't bumped up, but if I've renovated majority of the units and, and leased those up at $900 over the past three months, I can show a story of the upward trending values. They will many times give me a higher value on the $700 a month units as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, anticipation of the new lease. Uh, coming yep. Up. yep. What, what I tell all the multifamily guys that we work with is be out there at that project when the appraiser's there. Oh, like, for sure. Yeah, it if is. You're not, if you're not there, you, they are, you, they're not going to understand your vision and you're not going to be able to explain everything that you want to do. And, mm -hmm. You know, that's a great point. That, it's a really big deal. I mean, I mean, I've seen a, a difference of, you know, a, the same property appraising for $400,000 less just mm -hmm. because someone wasn't there to tell the story. And we, I mean, we've had million dollar, I mean, on bigger properties, we've had million dollar swings on appraisals before. Yeah. It's, it's because they, they didn't allocate this or they didn't like, you got to kind of do the job for them, right? Like it's easier to wholesale a property. If you've already done all the due diligence, if you've done an inspection, if you can provide a, a rehab quote, if you can provide comps and you give that to somebody that you're trying to sell the property to, right? You've done all the work for them. Same thing with the appraiser, right? The appraiser doesn't want to go and do all the work. You have to give them all the information and hand it to them on a silver platter. So then they're like, Oh, you know what? This guy already did that, my job for me. Let me just submit this to the bank, right? And obviously, they're going to look at everything and review it yeah, all. Sure. They're not going to uh, do anything. But yeah, I mean, my commercial mortgage broker, he flies to every single property whenever it gets appraised, and he's meeting with the with the yep. appraiser, talking them through everything. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we do this. We we tell our borrowers to do the same thing on single family fix and flips. It's a, it's one thing to hand them a list of what you're going to do. It's another thing for them to walk through. Uh, talk about the materials they're using the vision for what this place is going to look like when it's finished. Cause you know, it, it's hard to, it's hard to see when there are walls there. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard for them to, you know, kind of picture it while they're sure. doing it. So yeah. that helps. Yeah. Um, let, let me talk about your investors if, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you're, you're buy and hold. Uh, so you're going to refinance and you're going to repeat uh, essentially. So when you bring investors into your fund, are you keeping them in there or as the values have become stabilized and you refinance, are you buying them out or it just depends on each uh, uh, property that you're doing? Yep. Good question. Um, so first, every building that I buy is its own fund, right? right. I, I raise on a per deal basis. I don't have like a general open-ended fund and you come sure. and go or you have a little priest of everything. It's just do you like one, two, three main street? No. Then how about four, five, six Oak street? You know, like let's, let's take a look at different opportunities, different deals. Um, Cause there's different appetites for, you know, different investors. Some of them like new construction. Other ones want cash flowing assets from day one. Other was, others like short-term rentals. Right. And, um, mm -hmm. and, and some want to be involved in all of them. So uh, each deal is, is its own fund. And when we raise money on a deal, my typical structure for either a new construction or a value add is, 
over the next 36 months, I'm going to force appreciation by the sweat equity that, that the operating team is going to be putting in, right? We're increasing the income. We're decreasing the expenses. we got better management in place. We're going to turn over the tenant base. We're going to bump up all the rents, renovate all the units, reduce the utility expenses, appeal the property taxes, all that stuff. And because we can create, kind of like I showed an example earlier, so much appreciation in such a short amount of time, again, we're able to be into a $10 million building for $7 million. And if I can go get a 70 or 75% LTV loan in that, in that area, then that allows me to then get all my money and all my investor money back off the table. So I can pay off the short-term acquisition loan. I can pay back all of my investors. And the way that I pay my investors, I give them a, they like to see, I, I've realized there's typically two types of investments. One's either like a fixed debt type of a return where it's predictable sure. cash flow, but there's no equity upside mm -hmm. or no equity downside. And then the other one is that equity, right? There's big upside, but there could also be big risk and there's not the stability of cash flow. So we've kind of created a hybrid of paying a dividend while the money's invested. Once all the investors get their money back, then we also just, then they maintain their equity in perpetuity. So they might maintain, you know, I might, I might carve up a somewhere between 20 to 40% of all the equity in a deal, just give it to the investors and they hold on to that forever, even after their money um, comes off the table. So that allows them to have predictable cash flow on their money while it's invested. And then once they get it back, they can go and reinvest it to something else and have predictable cash flow. But then this first deal is still kicking off cash flows, right? It's still kicking off uh, the rental cash flows, even though. Uh, the preferred return isn't isn't being paid on that deal any longer. But yeah, they they maintain uh, their equity, so they get depreciation, they sure. get the principal pay down and appreciation, uh, they get all that stuff. But I've seen, and, and mine's kind of probably somewhere in the middle. I've seen uh, some people who just pay a fixed debt uh, for people investing in their in their multifamily. They pay six percent as you go, and they pay another six percent when they get refinanced, and then the investors have no more equity ever in the deal, and the operator mm -hmm. keeps a hundred percent of the equity. And then I've seen the other side of the spectrum, which is more of a traditional syndication where the investors have 70, 80% of the equity in a given deal. Um, and the operator only has a, a small portion. And maybe there's like a waterfall where once the investors get their money back, maybe it's 50, 50 split or, or whatever that looks like. But, um, it, and, and that's probably good for a more, more stabilized asset. If you're going to go buy something that's cash flowing from day one, that's a good route to take. Um, but if you're putting a lot of sweat equity into the property, you're creating that appreciation as the general operating partner. Uh, I, th I, I think you're, you know, uh, there's a lot of value that you're creating and, and you need to be compensated with a little bit more equity. Um, and, and you got to be, you know, aware of some of the traditional syndications because I've seen a lot of fees get taken off the table by operating partners and, G right. and GPs um, yep. where it's really not like, you know, I, I, I like our model because really, the GPs and the LPs were in the same boat, rowing in the same direction. I Your get interests paid. are aligned. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I get paid when they get their money back, right? I, yeah. I've only taken an acquisition fee on maybe 40% of the deals I've done, maybe 50%, I don't know, somewhere in the half range. Um, and I don't take acquisition or um, asset management fees or fundraising fees or capital events fees or disposition fees or anything like that. Um, we just do, hey, maybe there's a small acquisition fee to keep the lights on at our, at, with our company and keep the payroll paid. And then when the property performs, that's when I start getting paid as well. So, uh, you know, I, I like that. I think the investors like that, but it, it, it all depends on the deal and depends on the operator. Yeah, sure. And as you know, some investors, sometimes they just need the money, uh, even though they wanted that equity piece, um, you know, things change over three years. For sure. Um, so sometimes I was going to say that it, yeah. if it's one where you've refinanced and you're giving them their uh, equity piece uh, in a, bonus cash, let's say, and you're refinancing it, that cash is not taxable because it's not a sales event. Uh, it was a cash out refinance event. Mm -hmm. yep. And so that still saves them on, on taxes as well. Uh, Big time. And then the depreciation offsets all the other cash flows, you know? Sure. Exactly. Okay. It's just knowing your investor. I mean, when you, you said the six and six model, the six pref with the, with the six uh, kicker at the end, that's going to fit more of a, like a, like a self-directed IRA person. Because sure. depreciation means nothing to an IRA. Yep. Whereas, you know, cash depreciation means a lot more. Fair so it's just so. knowing your investor and which which avenue you want to take. I was going to yep, say that self-directed uh, retirement account currently. Yeah, as long as there's no changes. Yeah. <laughs> um, Tim, thank you so much. Uh, you, you really 
went through some uh, high level information and you did it in a very non-complex way. So we appreciate it. Can you throw up his, uh, his website? Uh, this is how you can get a, a hold of Tim um, if you want to invest in some multifamily syndications. And, and you do yeah. other things other than just multifamily too. Didn't you say you did some short-term rentals I, and stuff as well? Yeah, I have, I have, um, I, I've done it. I've, I've done it all right. Like I've done, I, I have primarily my portfolio today is, I don't know, I would call it probably 20% new construction. I'd call another 70% is value add apartment buildings. And there's probably 10% of like these very unique, uh, short-term rental type properties. Like I have this ridiculous castle up in Western North Carolina, up in, on 50 acres. Um, nice. It's like a, a big mountain house. And then I, I bought an island in outside of like Hilton Head, Beaufort area, um, 110 acres that we're putting some short-term like glamping tents on. Yeah. And so we do, we do some stuff that's very unique short-term rentals. I had some stuff down in like Florida where they just, you know, carbon copy house after house after house and make them into these short-term rentals. And there's just, there's so much supply that there's not enough demand. It doesn't matter how much demand there is. Uh, yeah. The values just aren't there. So I, I wouldn't do that. But do you remember, well, do you remember? You stated that? that? No, I said, I think I saw the mountain house. Didn't you have a mastermind there? Yeah. Yeah. I had one there just a few saw, weeks ago. Saw the video. It was a really nice looking place. Sorry. What was it? Six, seven it. years ago. We, didn't we look at doing uh, a, on Defusky Island, that resort thing? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we were, we were right there. We didn't do it. And you know, and well, and then a hurricane came through, so we were glad we didn't do it, but yeah, Jonathan was working for another uh, company at the time. He was working for a family office and we were trying to put a deal together and I was volunteered to take the first boat out to the Island after the hurricane came through and see if it was still oh, there. Man. <laughs> oh man. The, the Island fared well, not, not too many of the trees did, but uh, mm -hmm. the Island uh, fared well. It's a, it's a neat place. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool the area. Is really, really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is kind of on the other side of Hilton Head. This is on the, the North side of it, like right next okay. to Paris Island. Okay. Oh, nice. Excellent. Nice. Well, listen, I, we don't want to keep you too long. We're already past our time, but uh, your information is always uh, top notch and I didn't want to interrupt it. Um, Appreciate you, man. Thank, thank you guys thank, for having me. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you for joining us on the real estate investor show. Hard money for real estate investors. We are Carolina Capital Management. We are lenders in the Southeast for real estate investors. If you are interested in borrowing money, go to carolinahardmoney.com and click on the apply now tab. If you're a passive investor looking for passive returns, then click on the accredited investor tab. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, hit the bell and sign up for Wednesdays with Wendy.